Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. It's good to hear that din. It's good energy in the room. So I'm Deshaun Drew. I'm the president of Minnesota Public Radio, and I'm also the senior vice president of American Public Media Group. In my role, I lead the teams that uh, you think of as NPR News, The Current, Your Classical NPR, and Marketplace. Um, it's, it's the best job I've had. I've been here about 30 years in the Twin Cities and really um, have just come to love all that we get to do at NPR, including partnerships like Little Moments Count. Um, we are really invested in this work in helping to set our youngest people up for their best and brightest futures. So together we're building awareness about the critical brain development that takes place in the first three years of life, and we're trying to inspire action by parents and other caregivers to help our young people be their best. I'm grateful for the collaboration that we have uh, with many of you in the room, maybe all of you in the room. Um, particularly grateful for our friends at Health Partners, uh, Andrea Walsh, Pure Yang Hoffman, who's the uh, VP for Government and Community Relations, um, and I know some of the other Health Partner staff are here with us today as well. Thank you for your support and your partnership. I should tell you there's a former journalist, uh, specifically a former education reporter. That's why I went into journalism back in the day. This is uh, an area that's near and dear to my heart, and I'm so proud to um, see uh, the progress we're making and see the support that we've got for this movement. So with that in mind, um, I'm happy to tell you that we added in the last couple of months an early childhood education reporter so that we can dial, dial in. So if you don't have Kyra Miles's information already, here's an option to jot it down. So this is the way it works. I can tell you, like the stories you hear are because someone thinks more people need to know about this, whatever the this is, right? They think this is important, this is interesting, this is concerning, insert X here, right? This is something people need to know about. I should call the, you know, the folks at NPR, in this case specifically, Kyra Miles, and, and tell them what's going on. So she's just moved to Minnesota. She moved from the Gulf States area. And so really, um, some of you in the room, I know I've had a chance to meet with her already and are helping her get her arms around the beat. And anybody else, once again, I'm gonna beat this horse, right? Like, this is how it works. Good people who have a sense of what's going on in community reach out and, and let us know what's happening. She's not able to be with us today. She's traveling, but has been aware of this event and is expecting phone calls and emails. So before we dive into today's presentation, I, I want to just take a moment to thank our sponsors for today's event. Uh, we have the support of the Start Early Funders Coalition in making today's event even happen. Uh, I know that some of the leaders are involved in this work are here today. I saw Carrie Johnson disappear into the crowd somewhere. Hey, sweetheart, good morning. Carrie Johnson, Allison Corrado, Nancy Jost, Dan Grossman, and Betty Amarita. Thank you so much for this partnership. Really, really very appreciative of the work that you're doing. Thank you for your stalwart leadership and your support of early childhood initiatives all across the state of Minnesota. I also want to extend uh, thanks to Before Racism, the new nonprofit that's providing a comprehensive and anti-bias training program for childhood centers all across the state, and specific to Bills for Luga, who is here with Bill Go. I saw him earlier. There you go. Good morning, Bill. Um, thank you for the partnership. If you haven't heard of Before Racism, please look into it. Um, really important work at helping child care providers and other um, folks in that space just get a better grasp of what's possible for helping their young people understand these issues more deeply. I can only assume that if you're here today, you're in some way familiar with Early Risers, which is a podcast from Little Moments Count. It's produced by NPR and hosted by Ann, Diane Halsey. Wave, Diane. Good morning, my friend. That podcast, which we started in the wake of George Floyd's murder, is a way that we help adults learn to talk with young children about race and racism. Uh, as a creator and the host of this podcast, Diane shares a vision for a future free of racism, which she sees as starting with how we talk with our young children about race and differences. While the conversations between Diane and her podcast guests continue to be at the heart of this work, The Early Risers has expanded to reflect a multifaceted approach to addressing race, cultural identity, and implicit bias in early childhood education, including now 27 episodes. 27, right? We did this, it was Diane's idea, and we just did this on a whim. Like she said, would you be willing to partner with us on this? And we thought, <laughs> we should find a way to get to yes on this. 
Let's see what happens, right? 27 episodes later and, and more to come, right? Um, it's become a real important and I think staple uh, kind of uh, vehicle for people to have these important conversations. We all know that not talking about things doesn't make them better, right? So I wanna thank Diane uh, in front of all of you for, for having the vision and the courage, right? She's not a broadcaster, right? To say, this is something we should do, will you do this with us, with me? So thank you. So I should note that, that if you're not familiar with the podcast, um, look for it. Uh, it includes uh, all kinds of facets. It's a really built out website, all kinds of discussion, topics and questions for people to explore. It's almost like you use as a book club, frankly. If you would listen to an episode, you could then sit with others and kind of process it collectively. And we've also done multiple uh, hour long specials that have been distributed to more than 100 stations and repeatedly across the country. This is running in markets all over the US now. So in a few minutes, uh, we're going to watch the award-winning documentary film reflecting on anti-bias education in action in the early years, followed by a conversation led by Diane with today's special guest filmmaker, Debbie Lee Keenan. Debbie Lee Keenan is a co-director of Anti-Bias Leaders, ECE, as well as a lecturer, consultant, and an author currently residing in Seattle, Washington. She was director of the Elliott Pearson Children's School at Tufts University in Medford, Mass. from 1996 to 2013. In addition to teaching in the Elliott Pearson Department of Child Study and Human Development at Tufts, she's been a member of the Early Childhood Faculty at Lesley University in Cambridge, Mass., and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Some pretty big schools there, my friend. I like it. <laughs> she's a former preschool, special education, elementary school teacher. Debbie is a curriculum advisor for Sesame Street Workshop's Racial Literacy Initiative. And she was awarded the Tufts University Arts and Science Multicultural Service Award in May of 2003. The Building Bridges Tufts Distinction Award in June of 2009 for her work with diversity and the Abigail Elliott Award in 2015, which recognizes outstanding commitment to young children and the early childhood profession. Debbie holds a master's degree in education from the University of New Mexico and she consults lectures locally, nationally and internationally. She's the author of numerous books and articles on anti-bias education and is a producer with John Nemo of the film Reflecting on Anti-Bias Education in Action, The Early Years, which was released in April of 2021. Please give a warm welcome to Debbie Lee Keenan. Thank you. Thank you, Minnesota Public Radio, Little Moments Count, and Early Risers for inviting me to come to Minnesota to share our film reflecting on anti-bias education in the early years. A shout out to all the sponsors and everyone here today. It's a testament to the collaborative effort and commitment to social justice work here in Minnesota. It's truly an honor to be here in Minneapolis, the site of George Floyd's murder which reignited the fight for racial justice across the world. I've shared this film in many, many places. However, the gravitas of this place does not go unnoticed. I had an opportunity yesterday to visit George Floyd Square. It was profound and emotional. I'm still processing it. But I felt a strong sense of place a collective outpouring of sadness, outrage, and hope. It's truly a people's memorial. Our film is a collaborative partnership with my co-producer, John Nimmo, um, and good colleague and friend. Uh, he works at Portland State University, and Feliz F.A. McKinney of Brave Sprout Productions in Seattle. Um, uh, Louise Derman Sparks, also our good friend and colleague, was a senior advisor on the project. And the film is made possible by a generous grant by the Tyler Rigg Foundation. So our film has been released, was released in 2021 for free streaming, and has been seen in every state across the country, as well as over 100 countries around the world. So why did we make this film? That's a frequent question we get. And the film is a response to the frequent questions we hear, what does anti-bias education look like in the classroom? Yes, there are books, there are journal articles, you can take a course about it, but, and there are a few videos, but the ones that existed were very outdated. 
So that's why we made it when people kept asking. We need to see it. Um, but we feel a unique aspect of this film is it shifts the focus from the talking heads of experts onto the voices and actions of teachers who are committed to bringing equity and diversity into their classroom every day. So the film is a series of classroom vignettes with teachers reflecting on their identity, their context, and practice. And it's organized around the four anti-bias goals of identity, diversity, justice, and action. We wanted to show teachers who were vulnerable, who were willing to take risks, and make mistakes. The anti-bias journey, it's lifelong. And the teachers in this film are brave. They share their minds, their hearts, and their souls. And they represent teachers who do this work every day. Preparation for our film began in 2018, the filming in 2020, and the post-production work in early 2021. The teachers featured in the film work at two schools in Seattle, Washington, and one school in San Francisco, California. We worked with the teachers at all three sites before we actually did the filming. We did workshops on anti-bias education for the programs. We met with directors, and we provide individual coaching to the teachers um, who had particular issues around what was going on in their classroom. The filming in San Francisco took place during the momentous uprising for racial justice and the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. So you'll see in the film um, people wearing masks at some point. Um, all of the scenes with the children were filmed as they were actually happening in the classroom. There's no actors. So anti-bias education is, a series of is not a series of activities. It involves setting up your environment in culturally responsive ways to meet the cultural backgrounds of the children and families you serve. And it involves listening and responding to children's questions, comments, and thoughts about unfairness, bias, prejudice, as well as things that are happening in their community. Finally, the message of this film could not be more timely and urgent. And while the film is about early childhood classrooms, we believe this film is relevant for all ages, all people, in all kinds of settings. We believe anti-bias work is possible and doable, and there's not just one way to do it. There's not a simple recipe or a copy what you see in this film. It involves critical thinking, understanding your, the complexity of the issues, responding to your children, your teachers, your families, your community. The film is a provocation to generate dialogue about how to bring this philosophy, this lens, equity and diversity into the heart of your organization. It's, we hope it's a catalyst for change, whether you're talking about your classroom, your school, your home, your place of worship, your business, your nonprofit. What can you do to make a difference? As teacher Veronica in the film asks us, what kind of human do you want to be? So as you watch this film, um, we are gonna, I'd like you to think about these questions. <laughs> connect. What do you connect to in the film? Extend. What new ideas do you have that brought in your thinking? And challenge. What challenges, puzzles, or questions come to mind? And after the film, we'll be asking you to share some of your thoughts. So enjoy. First of all, let me say that was just amazing. Yes, another clip. It's definitely an artist. I want to take a moment, a brief moment, to um, frame this up for uh, this viewing in Minnesota. And then I want us to be able to respond to the prompts that Debbie gave us earlier, right before we viewed the film. 
Um, so many of you know I've been working in the field of early childhood human services for many years. And Louise German Sparks, who is one of the senior advisors of this film, was one of my first guests on Early Risers during season one. And her book, What If All the Kids Are White, and basically her leadership in anti-bias education has been an inspiration for me for many, many years. In particular, um, her leadership about how to teach white children about race. One of the reasons it inspired me is because um, I've done advocacy on the statewide level in Minnesota on early childhood issues. Um, and I repeatedly continued to hear from providers that they did not believe they needed to take any kind of bias education or diversity courses because all the pro children in their program were white. In fact, at one point in time, there was an actual law made that you had to take some kind of diversity training in order to get licensed, but so many providers complained about it that um, they stopped, um, you know, basically they stopped uh, the law. They, they stopped, uh, yeah, enforcing it. So we hosted this film in hopes that we can change that narrative here in Minnesota and begin to see that we are all responsible to teach all children about race and equity and diversity. And I think we've gotten a huge a head start just by watching, um, watching this film today. So I'm gonna pass it over to Debbie so she can help us to reflect a little bit briefly. Yeah, we'd love to ha hear some of your thoughts you know, what did you connect to in the film? How are you feeling? What are the, what are your thoughts? What are some of your questions? Um, we'll take just a, a short amount of time to do this, then uh, Diane and I are gonna continue the conversation, and then there'll be more questions at the end, so don't worry if you yes. don't get your questions answered. And Frank here has a mic to pass around if people, Thea and Thea, Thea too, right, okay. So, yeah, what are you connecting to? What are you yeah. thinking? Well, I didn't think um, it would bring me to tears, but it did. Mm -hmm. And um, the question, what kind of human being do you want to be? Um, I'm going to think about that for a long time. And uh, just the hopefulness of the children. Everything is so normal mm -hmm. um, compared to when I grew up. We didn't talk about those things. So I, I, it just gives me so much hope. Oh, I'm sorry. Nancy Jost from West Central Initiative. Someone else? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What did you connect to? Beth Meninga with the Center for Inclusive Child Care. Mm. I'm thinking about the power of parallel process and the adults and how if, if we want the children to be able to give those voices and that sense of social justice and feel safe taking the risks, the adults need to be able to do that. And we need to create supports, continue to build supports for that and promoting that in a way that really um, echoes through to families, children, and the adults doing the work. Someone else want to share oh, right your thoughts right behind? Yes. Uh, Corey Woosley, Minneapolis College. Uh, what I was thinking is when I watch those educators in the classroom and I hear their conversations, I think about the days that I go out to visit my practicum students and I'm not hearing those conversations. Mm -hmm. So what, what is our role to, to educate our teachers on how we, can, how we can do this in the classroom better? We probably have time for one more. Hi, I'm Angela Watts with Hennepin Healthcare, so I'm more in the health sector. But what resonated for me was, even though it wasn't concretely seen, it was absolutely families and communities in that space. And they were brought in in a way that was organic and authentic, and they were part of the process, and it was very inclusive. Thank you, everyone. Um, so one of my um, reactions to the film is that um, I too kind of, somebody said they didn't know that they'd be crying, I think it was Nancy. I found myself getting emotional too. And I started to ask myself like, why am I getting emotional about watching <laughs> this film? And I think um, part of it is 
that um, somebody else might have said, you know, this is not how, and even in the film, I think somebody said, this is not how we were raised. And um, in a good way, like this is something that I wish we would have had when I was, say, in preschool, or even that my children could have experienced when they were in preschool. This is the kind of environment I would have, I would have wished for them. And it's very intentional. And so can you talk a little bit about how you even chose these particular classrooms, you know, to kind of be the basis of this film? Because they were just, um, they were very intentional, and you could tell they had been working for quite a while. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, we were looking for teachers who were willing to be filmed. Mm -hmm. um, we considered them very courageous to do this. Um, and we knew we weren't looking, this wasn't for people who didn't think this was important. We weren't looking for teachers who were actually, I don't think I should do this. You know, we feel we had to start with teachers who were, who do this work. And basically what I started first with is looking for directors, looking for leaders. We didn't go around picking teachers, but we were looking for programs because mm -hmm. I know that a teacher can't do this work in isolation. If we wanted to show what's possible, they can't do it alone. They have to have the support of the community, of their school community, and create that culture. Yeah. Um, so we reached out to different uh, directors and leaders of programs that we knew created this kind of culture, that this was part of their mission statement. So there are programs that are committed to social justice already. And then within that, um, we talked about, we knew we wanted to focus with this age group. We were going to go with preschool. We could have done infant, you know, there, as we said, this can be done with all ages, but we had decided we wanted to do preschool. So um, I think, and we were limited, of course, well, with our funding that, and we were all in the Pacific Northwest, so we couldn't do this nationally in terms of the budget. However, we were careful to choose, make sure in the film we want it to feel doable, accessible, and it's actually, we're not profiling the schools. You know, they are listed right. in the credits, but we're not saying, well, this is this school, this is that school, then, mm -hmm. you know, only, you know, that that's how you do it but rather they're individual teachers. The, the, we intentionally, you see the different teachers come from different schools in each segment. So it's organized by the goals and all of them are contributing in different ways. So mm, yeah, about that. beautiful. So you have been um, showing this film all around the country and talking to people about the film. What has been like the overall general reaction from audiences after viewing? overwhelmingly positive, and we have shown it in red states, blue states, purple states, <laughs> um, places where there's a lot of pushback and opposition right now, in Florida, in Texas, in Arizona, Wyoming, um, as well as obviously places that are really committed to this. Um, and I think what they do is resonate to that it is, uh, well, you saw in that, that children can do this, that it's mm -hmm. th that last, the last go for, you know, spreading the world, that it's the kids who are leading. So people feel like, oh, this is capable. Yeah. We've also shown it in, with, for business settings. Uh, that was surprising. It was created as a PD film for professional development when yeah. John and I were thinking about this. This is what we need. Um, but we've been surprised how it has this, uni everyone's been interested in it, who's seen it. Um, and in businesses, the comment is, uh, someone said this here, you know, if the kids can do this, why can't we? You know, mm. so overwhelming has just been positive. It's been used as also as part of university courses, um, and it is available also in uh, Spanish and it's closed caption in English, Spanish, and Chinese. Mm -hmm. Yeah, available there. Nice. Overseas. So you talk about uh, that it was actually created for professional development, um, and I think I heard uh, Corey um, Corey Woosley talk about how what you're seeing in the film is not really what you're seeing, you know, in, in the classroom. And, um, and I can attest to that as well. Mm -hmm. So how do you move from trying to figure it out to what we're seeing on this film? Like what, <laughs> what are the steps you need to right. take to, to actually have a classroom right. like that? Right. 
So it's not just the classroom. It's like I said in, when I introduced the film, this is a really a, a lens, a perspective that's a part of everything you do. So it has yes. to be part of your mission yeah. statement, part of your hiring, part of you know, your policies and procedures. Mm -hmm. And most important, I feel, as having been a director of, of programs, is um, creating the culture that allows for belonging, inclusion, allows for many different voices, allows for risk-taking, um, allows for making mistakes. Um, we have to do that. Um, I had a director that once said to me, my goal was to move from a culture of kindness to a culture of courage. Mm -hmm. We were looking for mm -hmm. a safe and brave space, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. um, we want that atmosphere where people can um, share their views, be able to take, make mistakes, be able to, when they fall, to be able to get up, um, and to acknowledge that all of us as adults are on a different point in that journey. And so to be open, that like even the teachers in those films, yes, they were all very vulnerable and open. Not, there are clearly very veteran teachers there who have been teaching many, many years in this way. Mm -hmm. And there were some teachers, it was just like their first year, mm. but they, were, you know, they were becoming part of that culture. They were mentors. The philosophy in the school were supporting them um, and were trying to do that. So that's the first thing. I think it's also finding your entry point, feeling comfortable to put one step in front of the other. Don't be afraid. Some people say, oh, I can't do this, so I've done all of this. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. just pick one thing. I'm going to start with my mission statement, or I'm okay. going to start with the environment, make sure I have those mirrors and windows. Mm -hmm. You know, those four goals, I do feel when people say, how do I do this? I say there's no recipe, no model. But those four goals are your framework. Put them on the wall. Mm -hmm. And those goals are for adults. So therefore, mm -hmm. the, so the other point, I think, in this how do you get started, what do you need to do, is we need to do our own work. Um, meaning we all have work on our, understand our identities, our biases, um, and to lean into that discomfort that it may bring because we can't be authentic with others until yeah. we kind of do our own work. Um, but I think you're doing that all at the same time. You know, some people say, oh, I can't do anything to I do my own work. No, that's not what I believe. I believe we can do more than one thing. We can work on ourselves yeah. and we could do the work of whatever our, whatever our organization is. If you're a teacher, if you're a director. You know, yeah. yeah. And let's talk about that, um, the first goal, identity, a little bit. Uh, because what, what, I, what I witnessed, what I think I witnessed in this film are teachers that were very um, clear about who they were as people uh, first and didn't mind sharing and being vulnerable in their classroom with their children. And um, how do we get to, to that mm. point, you know, and how, how, how do you um, foster that culture in, in a classroom so that everybody kind of knows who they are and brings that to the table? Because we know that that teacher-child relationship is incredibly important when it comes to this. Yeah. I love it when teacher Carla says, you know, I share who I am so that the children will share who they are. Mm -hmm. So I think it's feeling comfortable with yourself in doing that and feeling that um, it's also about, again, I have to go back to that culture that I know my colleagues, I know my co-teachers, I know who they are. It's relationship-based. I think best t good teaching, best teaching, um, certainly with an equity focus, but just t teaching in general, mm -hmm. right? It's about relationships. So it's not re just you relationships with your families and with the uh, children, but it's a relationship with your colleagues, right? So you need to have opportunities. We need playtime. We need to get to know each other as staff, right? Mm -hmm. People come in, share, where did you get your name? The first day of school, um, you know, you have your staff meeting. It should be things like that. Um, and this should be a part of every staff meeting. Anti-bias, mm -hmm. it's not like, oh, I did my anti-bias uh, PD. The directors, we've done it for the year. No. When I was director, every session, every we would start with some kind of icebreaker that had to do with anti-bias in some way about identity or about something, a question that came up from your kids, let's talk about that, and then we'd go on to whatever we needed to talk about. But it has to be kind of what you're breathing. And once you start doing it, it's contagious. I like that. I like how you say that you talk about that practice that has to happen even in, in adult meetings. And I think... Um, you know, on early risers, I talk a lot about how people need to be, um, people oftentimes are not comfortable even talking about race. Adults are not. 
Um, but you're, the way that you're talking about it, and there's a lot of things about race that we shouldn't, uh, we, we should feel perfectly comfortable talking about, but we're still not. Um, but like, you know, just sharing things about, you know, origins of our names or the kind of foods that we eat or the texture of our hair or all of those kinds of things sometimes we feel is taboo. And so what are some of the things that you that you do, even with adults, to help them to feel like this is an OK conversation? Yeah. So having different um, I think. The frequency of doing it is yeah. important. So it's not just a one and done idea. So that right. if you, they know we're going to be talking about different things, having fun, laughing mm -hmm. over it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's see, what are some uh, talk? Yeah, just what you, different kinds of prompts. I, I find that works really well, as you said, where we got our name from. Um, how, what was the first time you noticed someone who was different? So have mm -hmm. them go back to our own childhood. How did you learn about diversity in school? Mm -hmm. You know, was it more kind of what we call that colorblind approach or difference denial mm -hmm. that we don't talk about it, you know, or that, you know, we're all the same? Or was it more of a tourist approach? So mm -hmm. I like going, have people share their um, earlier experiences, how, as a child, mm -hmm. what were the messages you got from your family? How did you learn about difference? Or how did you learn, you know, of a white person says, oh, I don't, you know, well, we don't have any identity. Everyone has identity. Yeah, and everyone yeah. has, mm -hmm. everyone, is, we need to understand about diversity. It's not that I'm diverse and you're not. Diversity is about the relationship between us. So we're all working on those four goals. Mm -hmm. So I think unpacking those, that's a, those are good prompts too, just base them off the goals. Um, but just providing opportunity to talk about these things, um, going back and looking at our own experiences growing up because... I also think, you know, we carry our ghosts with us on our yes. shoulders, right? Yes, and do. so we need to be comfortable of understanding. We all have biases. We all have differences. We all have similarities. And just to be more cognizant of it, because a lot of this is implicit. We don't realize our reactions with others right. often have to do with the ghosts on our shoulders. So if we start to acknowledge or learn about those ghosts, we'll mm. become more authentic. So I think it's about authenticity with mm. others, too. Good. I like that. Um, now, I want to talk about, um, I think I have to talk about the Black Lives Matter yes. moment in, in the video. And I think um, that really hit home with me um, and in many, for many different reasons. Um, but one of them, and you did say, you did tell us as you were introducing us, introducing this, that it was filmed in 2020. And that, um, so these are, you know, like real time reactions that we are we are witnessing, and um, I think what what really struck me in watching that was that the children. Well, I understand the the desire as an adult to kind of want to put some boundaries and structure around some things, but the children were not allowing that to happen. <laughs> they were so. I mean, they were. They knew what they wanted. And they were so um, direct about it that they were kind of ahead of where the adults were. However, the adults didn't stop them. They just followed their lead. And, um, and I loved that. I loved, I loved watching and, and hearing about that. And by allowing, um, the, by allowing the children to lead, they got this beautiful result. And that statement that the, that young yeah, child was I reading know. at the end, I just, yeah, that was amazing. That was amazing. And um, and can you talk a little bit about the importance of allowing children to lead in this in in this particular subject matter, and also like what was your response as you were watching this unfold before you? Oh, it. Well, so much happened. You know, originally we were supposed to go to San Francisco in April, and then there was the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So then we didn't even know were we going to be able to do anything um, with that school at all. And then George Floyd is murdered. You know, where schools are closed, but then things are co opening up, and the school in San Francisco still wanted us to come. We 
they wouldn't allow us to physically be there. I had to find someone in their, uh, you know, in their pod that would be able to film for oh. us, and we directed and interviewed <laughs> oh my through Zoom. Because like all the others were in person doing all this, we couldn't do that. Yeah. So just the logistics of it. Wow. But it was so powerful. Um, I knew, you know, in talking to Nadia and Brian and talking about what was going on, you know, we felt. We were going to be able, they were opening up in July and in August. Mm -hmm. This is, I mean, we were, I think we filmed this in August. So it was very fresh. And they, I said, what's going on? And um, it might have been risky for us to do that also as filmmakers. How are mm -hmm. we going to capture that? But, you know, we just trusted, let's see what happens. So, of course, how you do films, you know, you get many hours of footage, like <laughs> six hours, yeah. and then we're distilling it to that. And, um, but it was extremely, um, yeah, powerful. You can see that, yes, to me, when Nadia's talking about it, no, and she's so honest. You know, says, yeah, yeah, I wasn't sure. Should I do this? <laughs> I mean, she's a phenomenal teacher. Yeah. But even then, you know, I mean, I'd love to hear how everyone here was, you know, the teachers here, what was going on. Because, you know, it's like, how do you, what, yeah, it was so say? emotional. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Um, but I guess what, your, your initial question about taking children's lead, anti-bias work, the best anti-bias work, I believe, comes from the children because it's what they're thinking about. It's what they're questioning about. What are they thinking? What, are they, what kinds of differences are they noticing? You know, anti-bias talks about all kinds of differences, right? We can talk about gender. We can talk about race. We can talk about family structure, language. But what are your children most curious about? So I believe you need to start with that. And mm -hmm. given this moment in time, this is what they're interested in. So we're going with it. Mm -hmm. And um, it was that we tried to also capture the idea that, you know, you need colleagues, you need allies. Again, it's risk taking. You have to be comfortable doing that. So the culture in that school obviously was supportive. The, right. the director, you know, was not going to say not to do that. Um, yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I think any good teaching is following children's lead, but mm -hmm. even more here, when you're nervous, trust. Mm -hmm. If you have good relationships with the children and yeah. families, you need to involve the families. Um, I will just balance that. You did hear it's also balancing following the children's lead and you as the adult um, offering provocations. provocations. So yes. it's always a balance. Yes. Yeah, that was yeah, that was that that whole yeah. exchange was just just phenomenal. Um, so, you did mention. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how this was um, not only received in different communities, but also about um, how uh, how family engagement is such an important part of anti bias work. Um, because I I imagine even in that scenario we were just talking about as we're doing family engagement, um, it may be that not all families um, were okay once they, came, once they came to pick up their child that day and realized there had been a Black Lives Matter protest, okay. you know, in the school. You, there may have been some right. families that weren't too cool with right. that. Or we've never even talked so, about it. Yeah, what's this? <laughs> right. And so, but that is a part of this work. And so how do you navigate those, um, you know, those, those discrepancies, those those uh, disagreements, you know, doing this work? First of all, two things. One, you can't do anti-bias work without engaging families because the children are part of families. It's really important. And you can't do anti-bias work with not having conflict. Because conflict, right, discomfort, disequilibrium is where we really learn. So we can't be afraid of that. Um, Anti-bias work is about, you know, different perspectives, different uh, viewpoints, different values uh, that we all bring. And so you're going to have, we're not always going to be 100% right. on the same page. We're living in a time where there's even more pushback and opposition. Mm -hmm. But I believe that if you can lean into this discomfort, not be afraid of it, see it as opportunity for growth, and even when you disagree with people, to be able to look at it as an opportunity for learning from each other. So with families, let's put this within the family mm -hmm. piece, it's about, you know, when families, when families and teachers in particular, if you come from different backgrounds, there's even going to be more conflict, um, more disequilibrium, because often the child is caught in the middle. Um, so your goal here is to really try to listen, find out more information from families, 
um, try to find some common ground or what we call the third space. Um, but I think we can always learn something, um, like I said, even if we disagree. Because the goal, in, I guess when, I, when families disagree with the school for something, it isn't about trying to prove that we're right or you're wrong if I'm the school, but it's rather about trying to get greater understanding from each yes. other. And yes. I think if we approach any kind of conflict on the big scale or the little scale that way, we're, we're better off. It helps fo move forward in this movement. I love that. Um, and I, I, I could talk to you all day, but I do want to, <laughs> about this, but you actually, um, you know, you have, um, you, you have, this is a phenomenal film, but it is actually just one part of your, you know, vast array of work that you do. And I hear that you're working on something new even now. And, um, I'd love to hear about that. So what, what, tell us what you're working on now. Very timely. It's about families. And I was so glad when you invited me to come and you were going to interview me because I loved your pot. I love your, I'm a big fan <laughs> of that podcast. I'm spread it around. And particularly the last year around families, because we're actually now, because of the good res great response for this, we've received funding. We're doing a second film and it's about, families engaging with parenting with an anti-bias perspective. Mm, oh wow. And we're following, again, no experts. We're, we're interviewing a, a group of different families, obviously different diverse families, and how they think about parenting uh, in their home. What does it look like in the home? What does it mm. look like in the community? And what does it look like inter it, with the schools in your yes. programs mm -hmm. and looking at that? And one of the things we're finding is that the families, um, the experience of families is much more, comp no surprise, but it is much more complex, much more personal, much more emotional than teachers doing this in schools. Yes. And so yes. to take that into account, um, yeah, we hope it'll be available in uh, 2024, similar, and we'll mm -hmm. offer it for free streaming again. So it'll be kind of companion to this Yes, <laughs> I can't wait to see it. Can't wait to see it. Yeah. Um, so now we would like to open up for questions from the audience. Hi, my name is Amel. Actually, one of my questions you answered because you said there's a film coming about parents. Because I was curious, when it comes to anti-bias, it's not just the work of the teachers and the students, but yes. also the parents. Yes. Because in America, we say the parents are the first and the most important teacher. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad that you guys are doing that. Um, but watching the films, one thing that kept coming to my mind was, you can't be what you can't see. So I mm. hope that the film had more of a Caucasian educators talking about their you know, anti-bias perspective. Because most of the time, you are more likely to see teachers of color be more, you know, fernable in these states or be more open about how they want to be anti-bias. And that would have been really helpful. Right. Thank mm. you for that. We were intentional. Actually, we feel there's a lot out there also about kind of the white perspective on this. They know it's important. We wanted to highlight black, indigenous, and people of color educators um, in our family. Of course, we feel this is important for all people to do. Um, we, in the family film, we also wanted to make sure one of the families is a white family um, and privileged to kind of talk about how they see what's important in doing this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, as obviously, we feel all people should be doing anti-bias education. Yeah. Absolutely. Good There's morning. No Over here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Laura LaCroix DeLoon. Yes. Hi, um, I have a question for you about working with really young children, yes. infants and toddlers. Uh, we've been doing some anti-bias work with family home visitors, mm -hmm. uh, so through local public health, tribal health, and early educators who go into the home. Can you speak a little bit about how this looks different for our very youngest yes. children? Yes, yes. Um, the work, the most important work, I think, with infant toddler teachers is really about being doing culturally responsive caregiving. Right? We can't have the kind of discussions you saw as a three to uh, you know, three or five, six-year-old can have. But uh, with young children, with uh, with infant toddlers teachers, the work I think is really knowing that parenting is culturally bound, mm -hmm. and so that there are again when that child can be the baby can be caught in the middle between home and school. So the, the practices you have in your infant toddler center may be very different from home to be aware of that, or child guidance techniques, separation, uh, attachment and separation, food. Um, there are so many areas, there's areas what we call cultural conflict. So 
for educators not to make assumptions. Okay, if you're, that when you see something going on in your classroom and you, or you wonder, why is that child not still have to be fed? You know, they're not independent yet, or they're still having toileting problems, or they're not toilet trained. Um, every culture is different in when toilet training should happen, or when someone's going to be using a spoon, or, or how they sleep, you know, or again, attachment. Um, so not to make that assumption, but rather to find out more from the family. So it really involves culturally responsive parenting and caregiving involves really our close partnerships with families, which involves a lot of learning from families, not so much teaching families, right, but that we're learning from them. So that kind of funds of knowledge and cultural strengths approach with families, I think, is very important. Mm. I mean, it's all ages, but particularly infant toddlers, right? Yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kelsey Johnson Kaiser. I'm with the St. Paul Public Library. And I would love your insight in what some of this work looks like in spaces where you have different kids, different groups. Maybe you've met them before, maybe you haven't. It's not that sort of... Um, same structured group of kids or educators that are together, yes. but when it's always changing, yes. what does it look like to do this kind of work? Interesting. I've done some. Uh, we've done some. I've done some work with libraries, the Washington State Library System, and actually museums have also reached out and do in sim similar what you're saying. So again, it's you know that's why we say you can't copy what you see here. You have to look at your. It's, yeah, taking those yeah. four goals mm -hmm. and what does it mean in your context right. so in a, you know it's again everyone being aware of their own identities how do you share that if you have story time what are the kinds of books you you're sharing it's also knowing um you know, balancing the kinds of books you provide, making sure they're not more of the stereotypic books, right? But also asking good questions. I think in library settings, it's a lot about, you know, even if a book isn't, you know, what is missing in this book? I think mm. that fair and unfair goal number three can be done a lot in kind of library or museum type uh, experiences. I think the harder piece, uh, what we've found is when I've done some workshops for libraries, particularly, you know, they say they don't know those families and they get the same questions. And so it's, they're not, not sure how to respond, but um, learning how to respond to the questions uh, and comments that children ask, not to avoid it, not to uh, ignore it. Um, even if you're not sure how to answer right then, to say that's a really good question, you can reflect it back, what do you think, let's talk about that. Um, so I think providing space, providing um, opportunity for book study groups, and I'm thinking of, because you mentioned from working with libraries, you know, so little, it could be parenting groups, it could be ch children's kind of little book study groups, things like that. So uh, yeah, it's different, but it's very important. <laughs> Hi. Hi. My name is Andrea Peer from okay. KRSM Radio. And my question is almost about, it's more or less about what you said, um, going back to your the, the second film that you're making. Mm -hmm you said that you were going to highlight a white family, a privilege um, to be a part of that discussion and conversation. And for me, I'm wondering, most people aren't a privilege regardless of color right now. So I'm almost wondering where the process where you're thinking about why to have a white family be a privilege if the other families are not. Why not have a white family who also is of the same median level? Because if we're always trying to reach white people who have a lot of money and things like that, who are really truly a minority of people, most right. people don't right. have that. Right. Isn't it more important to reach white people who are also like on that poverty line, also struggling to pay the bills because they are a majority more yes. that will come along more with yes. the conversation? We do have them also. I was mentioning that privilege was a big issue that's come up for some families, so we did include that. We also have, you know, it's hard in one film, right, to have everything, yeah. but I, uh, we do have uh, families of all different types of backgrounds. I, the other thing that's harder in making the uh, fa uh, family film has been finding families that are willing to go on film. Yeah. That's why when I your podcast, yeah. I said, oh, <laughs> if, yeah. not that it was easy, but it's part of me. We've had families that are very excited. They feel this important work, but they don't want to go on film. And then when we 
do something on, they've done an interview and it's amazing and they say, oh, well, actually, I don't want that. Um, they're worried when the children will grow up, they say, what were you saying yeah. Mom, you know, about that? So it's been harder, um, but we're, we're trying to have as wide range of socioeconomic, different types of people to be able to capture that in the film. Um, we also, though, didn't want to make it so it's just, you know, a little bit of each kind of person, you, a little bit of going in depth, so right. it's tricky. That's a vulnerable place to put a family, yes. is to talk, about, you know, to talk about race and how their family responds to that. That's, yeah. yeah, and their own background. And, and their um, own background, we have yeah. We also have some of the, it, it's been very moving and very powerful doing this also, yeah. of course, and how much we're learning. Um, and being respectful, we feel we have to be really respectful to anyone in the film, right? Yeah. This film as well as these families, so that if they say to us, no, I said that, but you can't use it. You know, we can't use it. Yeah. 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 Hello, Carrie Zeeland Johnson from Greater Twin Cities United Way and Start Early Funders Coalition. Um, I have a question that we talked a little bit about last night, and I just want to resurface it, is um, what are some go-to responses or um, advice do you have when you share this film and you receive some pushback? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have received pushback. <laughs> um, I mean, it's overwhelmingly positive, mm -hmm. but there were a couple, we have received some um, that's gone viral, but what I've learned about all that kind of thing is it, it has its own life and then it disappears. <laughs> um, and so we don't really have in interactions with those, that kind of pushback when it's on uh, the media or whatever. But I'm saying, you know, in normal workshops or presentations where you run into people who disagree with this. They don't think this is important or that's against my religion. Uh, a lot of the, um, the gender continuum uh, segments in the film, that's one of been, we've received a number of, uh, probably the ones that received the most, the most. Um, pushback. Um, just that people, and it's because people are uncomfortable. Um, it's because it's not part of their social identity. It could be intersecting with the social identity that, like their religion, which is a different social identity, right? So they're uncomfortable with that because, uh, yes, I think that's important, but my religion says no, or I, you know, so they're, they're, they're dealing with this internal conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think what I try to do is, you know, it's not forcing something on anyone, but really having conversation, leaning into discomfort, trying to understand where they're coming from, having them hear where I'm coming from, why I, why I feel this, why this is important work to do. Um, we want to make every child, every family be uh, visible, valued, and validated. You know, how do, and that this is part of that. Even if we don't have those types of families in our program right now, they exist in the world, and yeah. it's important for us to do that. Um, so, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not black and white. I guess the other piece I'll say is about embracing complexity, that it's not, life isn't black and white, either or, right or wrong, that rather we want to get away from that kind of dichotomous thinking, right? It's only this way or that way, mm -hmm. but rather it's about the and, right? We can do this and, we can learn and, mm -hmm. uh, we can be, I, we can disagree. We can agree to disagree mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and doesn't mean, you know, I hate your guts, you know, or I'm gonna, whatever, mm -hmm. do be violent about it. Um, we're gonna disagree. Mm -hmm. try, I try to be less non-judgmental than I might have been earlier. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> it's a journey. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, good morning. This is Ariel Handovit from the Northside Achievement Zone. I'm curious if you can speak a little bit more to the training that teachers received. You mentioned the anti-bias mm, yes. training and if any of the activities or things we saw in the video were things they took away from that or did you see a connection between the training they received and how um, the classroom was functioning in the film? Yeah, I mean, the, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, so as I said, we, we're working with teachers and programs that were already doing this, but again, it doesn't mean every single teacher or every single program was at the same point, because it is a journey. Uh, and we are constantly learning and constantly unfolding. Um, but I think the impact of the film being part of this um, has really um, heightened and 
more commitment and dedication in the programs as well as the individuals. Um, it's been wonderful to have, we have, have had opportunities to have the teachers um, do presentations with us, write articles, so that kind of their own professional growth, and just to dig deeper and reflecting on doing anti-bias work. Mm -hmm. They've had that opportunity through the film, but also it has continued from that, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Lara Bergman. I'm wondering if you can speak to, like when I was watching the film, the joy that you see coming through both the children and the adults that were working from them. Can you talk about the importance of joy in this work? We're talking yes. a lot about conflict yes. and navigating discomfort, yes. Yes. but I believe that joy is a really important piece and of I, yes. keeping it going. Yes, I agree too. Um, it's very easy for everyone to both the, particularly I think for the adults who are very committed to this, to be very, to be discouraged on that. But I think we have to bring joy into the work. And that's what I think this film does show that mm -hmm. it is there that we intentionally wanted, like a, any other classroom, you know, those typical laughs and elements that happen. Mm -hmm. I love that check, check, check thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it has nothing to do with anti-bias, but it, you know, it was like, yeah, that's what happens. And then he runs off, I'm, yeah. I'm done. <laughs> or when he says, teacher, you know, I yeah, love this, this book. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. So it's the kind of, these things happen every day, so we have to keep that joy. And I think with children, we have to focus on the positive. Um, I'll hark back to write, uh, Mr. Rogers, you know, how he says, um, you know, we have to focus on the helpers. So I think mm -hmm. that to me is power and that to me is what brings joy when kids, you know, if kids, when we see these difficult challenges, what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. Asking them that question. Um, and I'll say it's also really small things, small, you know, empowering children just to speak up. I, I talked about an infant, um, you know, someone sees a toddler crying and um, another little child brings over to the child their lovey, their blanket. Mm. That's goal number four. Yes. Do, showing empathy and doing action. Action. Love so it, it can start at little things like that and it could be other things. Why else are you crying when they get older? Yeah. Right? Um, I think we have time for one more question. My name is Megan Jackett. Um, I work in policy and advocacy with the St. Paul Promise neighborhood. And a lot of um, what was in the film resonated. We just uh, worked with parents for three weeks, six sessions for an advocacy cohort. And it's really parent-centered and parent-guided. And a lot of the conversations that came up organically during um, lunch and fellowship uh, reflected some themes in the video. And we're still going through... Um, parent evaluations and figuring out what our action steps are, but um, wondering for folks who are in the room and not necessarily in the classroom space, not necessarily in the direct service space, but are at the intersection of how we change our systems so that um, parents and families and children aren't at that gap. Um, and it's something on our parents' minds. So what is action in maybe the policy and advocacy space that you can recommend people take outside classroom and direct service? We talk about, um, we have, I actually have a new book coming out with uh, Louise and John also on leading anti-bias early childhood programs. And one of the things we talk about is strategic, how to do a strategic planning, anti-bias strategic planning mm -hmm. for any organization. Excellent. And part of that is mm -hmm. what we call, again, it's no surprise, reading the context, mm -hmm. getting your landscape, who are your, demo, you know, do a kind of uh, an analysis of the, your demographics, your resources, your obstacles, your barriers, your allies, uh, your stakeholders, and then, you know, you get your landscape, you do an analysis, and then go to goal setting. Often I see people right away, you know, here's what we need to do, you know, you have your board meeting, mm -hmm. and here are the goals mm -hmm. we're gonna work on this year. That's not strategic planning. You have to, you know, step back, and, and it's constantly changing, so to do that. Um, so that's one, I, I do think it's relevant. I think you can use those four, still those four goals. Identity, what are you doing in your organization? How are you, you know, working on these things? So that's one. Excellent. Debbie Lee Keenan, this has been phenomenal and a phenomenal conversation. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Coming. Debbie, I just want to echo what um, Diane just said. Thank you for coming to Minnesota and for sharing this film with us. And Diane, of course, thank you for your continued work with Little Moments Count and Early Risers to bring the topic of race, cultural identity, and differences to parents, caregivers, 
and all of us who care about young children, um, really all of us in this room. And thank you both for this really important conversation in the Q&A. So I'm, I'm going to your question about what connected with me. And uh, what I saw in this film was the importance of feeling safe in a place and with people. And people who know me know I'm an emotional person, but I don't get emotional. So something happened in this film for me. Um, it brought me back to this age and how I wanted nothing more but a name that was easy to say. And my parents moved a lot, so there's this constant fear of, oh God, here we go again. And how long it stayed with me, that feeling of not feeling like you belong, like already with your name, you're being outed as different, and how long it took me to, to love it. So um, to the question of what kind of human I want to be, I, I want to be the kind of human that will create a space where people feel that sense of belonging. So with that, I'm Puhua Yang Hoffman. <laughs> And, my role with, and in my role with Health Partners, I have the honor of working with so many of you uh, as part of the Lone Moments Count Collaborative. So I want to thank you all for your continued partnership. As you leave today, I want to provide you with a few closing thoughts on how you can continue this conversation and bring to light the opportunities we have to actively teach anti-bias in early childhood. Debbie and her team have created an amazing set of resources to help host screenings of the film and conversations about the topic of anti-bias education. So this QR code up here will take you to the site for the film, which contains a facilitator and viewer guidebook in English and in Spanish, along with lots of additional information about the film and its making. So thank you, Debbie, for sharing that with us. If you're not already a subscriber to Early Risers podcast and a follower on social media, you can use this QR code to access all of our social media channels and the Early Risers podcast collections page. And Debbie, I know that you're heading to Minneapolis College next to lead an in-depth workshop this afternoon with Early Child uh, hood educators, and that both this afternoon's session and this morning's event qualify for continuing education credits for early childhood educators. If you have questions about the continuing education credits, please seek out Carrie Johnson. Carrie, are you? Carrie, right there. Um, Carrie can help you answer some questions. Finally, please stop at the reception desk on the main floor uh, to return your name badges. We're nonprofits, these are really expensive. Turn them back in. Also, um, pick up your parking vouchers for the World Trade Center parking ramp if that's where you parked this morning. And I want to thank our NPR partners. Um, Twyla, thank you for helping produce this event, keeping us on time. Uh, thank you to Andrea Bork. Where are you? Thank you. Uh, and, and our engineers and our tech people, making sure that things are running. That's always my scary part. And, and all of you, uh, thank you for coming out and being part of this important work with us. Have a wonderful rest of your day.